Welcome everyone to the 2020 Santa Fe Community College Distributed Energy Workforce Summit. Um, we've got about 35 people in on the call right now and I'm, uh, I do know that we have close to 100 registrants. So I'm actually talking somewhat slow intentionally as I see the number climb. We went from 33 to 36 just since I clicked go. Um, but I do want to welcome everyone who is able to be with us today. Um, you've all been invited because it's part of your opportunity and our opportunity to ensure that we are working together to develop the workforce in distributed energy systems. So we're incredibly um, grateful um, to the EPSCoR um, Smart Grid grant the Economic Development Association, um, who've provided funding for us to be able to get started on these efforts. And to each and every one of you for the role that we'll play statewide in developing workforce so that we can actually fill these jobs um, through local and state means. So we're incredibly um, grateful for your pre presence here today and uh, tomorrow morning. Um, as part of the uh, EPSCORT Smart Grid Center, uh, Santa Fe Community College is absolutely committed to being a conduit in developing this workforce. I can't say that enough. I think in the last day and a half, we had a um, power outage. All of you have experienced it um, in Santa Fe County that lasted a number of hours. And what we're looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, are ways to ensure that we have resilient energy systems. So, um, all of us want to be a part of that. We've all known what it's like to have our, our energy down, to have to work with generators. This is the start of being um, on a path to a more resilient, sustainable energy system that will allow us to um, be more autonomous and less reliant on external sources for our energy. So let's look now at our um, housekeeping. Um, they will have, we will have session logins. You will be in on the login that you logged in with this morning until 10 o'clock. When we take a break, you will return promptly after a 10 minute break and you will have a new Zoom meeting links, a link at your e-agenda. So you will link on again at 1010 to a new Zoom meeting link. You will have ample opportunity for questions and participation. Um, you will have cues throughout the programming um, for when we will um, work in groups and when we will talk to our speakers and be able to ask questions after our interviews and portions of our seminars. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so today we have with us um, some presentations. First, um, George Ayala from the regional, the regional director of the U.S. Economic Development Administration, um, Department of Commerce. Um, isn't able to join us today, but he sent a video um, welcoming you all and sharing his thoughts on the work that we're doing. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining the Distributed Energy Workforce Summit today. My name is George Ayala, and I serve as the Regional Director for the Economic Development Administration covering five states, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and of course, the great state of New Mexico. We are part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Back in 2017, my team had the honor of working with the Santa Fe Community College and the North Central New Mexico Economic Development District to develop the Building Energy Automation and Microgrid Training Center. This center is an excellent example of how partnerships with educational institutions can spur innovative approaches to workforce development. With this grant, not only were jobs immediately made available on campus, but also jobs of the future, ones working with breakthrough technologies that are highly skilled and well compensated. Santa Fe Community College is meeting the new age of energy self-sufficiency and developing an ecosystem of innovation at its campus, and we are proud to be a partner in these efforts. EDA is focused on helping communities, educational institutions, regional governments and nonprofits bring plans for economic development into reality. We work with communities recovering from disasters, from economic loss, and those looking to revitalize their workforce. 
The Santa Fe Community College had a vision for this training center that excited my team. The plan to pair new technology with eager minds was a clear formula for success. Now on the surface, the EDA grant provided new equipment uh, for the microgrid training center and expanded access to this new program. But in reality, the EDA investment in partnership with the Santa Fe Community College is in the people. Those people who have the dream and the dedication and know-how to grow the center, and most importantly, to invest in the bright new minds that will power it into the future. I want to thank uh, Dr. Becky Rowley and Dr. Camilla Bustamante, the North Central New Mexico Economic Development District, and all those who continue to invest in the development of the microgrid training, training center. At EDA, we see a lot of success stories, a lot of projects that we fund, and some in particular show us how a great idea can become a beacon of positive change in the community. I want to congratulate the Santa Fe Community College Micro Training Center for being one of those great projects. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I hope you enjoy an informative and exciting summit. Thank you, George. <clears throat> you know, what, what George has said is absolutely true about the vision and the forward thinking of the people who've come through Santa Fe Community College and the Trades and Advanced Technology Center. It really is about a vision that was held um, better than a decade ago in moving forward and be making sure that we're addressing sustainability um, through advanced technologies. Next, we have Secretary Cottrell Probst. Sarah Cottrell Probst is the Secretary of New Mexico Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources for the State of New Mexico. Secretary Cottrell Probst, thank you for being with us today. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. I, I need to join George in saying, I, I can't say enough good things about Santa Fe Community College and the role that you play. Um, the the um, curriculum and the faculty are always on the cutting edge of clean energy and where this state and this nation should be. And so, you know, events like this are just one more, one more piece of that. So thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's happening in the policy space in New Mexico on clean energy microgrids um, and the like. Um, last year, you may be aware, we passed a, a monumental piece of legislation in New Mexico called the Energy Transition Act, or the ETA. And the ETA does a number of things, but one of them is set New Mexico on a track to 100% clean energy, zero carbon energy by 2045. PNM, our largest utility, has already said that they can meet that target five years early. Um, building up to that are a series of renewable portfolio standards, um, getting us toward that zero carbon goal. 80% by 2040 is the, the highest one um, in, the, in the act. The act also provides a lot of transition funding for uh, retiring coal um, community workers and, um, and for community projects. And Secretary McCamley might talk a little bit about that. Um, but setting a, a huge policy like that and a direction for the electric sector isn't enough. We know that we need to do more. And so this year we followed up that legislation with several more bills uh, that, that continue to move us down that path. One is the solar market development income tax credit. So this is a tax credit for New Mexico small businesses and homeowners who want to put solar um, at their home or their, or their business. And that's really important because it, it's helping and it's helping more than we, than we thought. We didn't realize a pandemic was right around the corner, but that really helps um, make the economics work for rooftop solar. And so some, I hope that many of you are going to leave uh, Santa Fe Community College's programs and go into that industry. And we hope that this, this policy will help um, make sure that that's a very viable industry going into the future. Another really important bill this year that, that passed and Representative Akil was one of the lead sponsors um, was the Energy Grid Modernization Act. And that bill um, is really, really important because we know that we wanna get to this 100% zero carbon electric future, but we're not 100% sure how we're gonna get there. And so we know that we need to make improvements to the electric grid um, and any number of strategies. And so one of the important things that the, the Grid Modernization Act did was direct our department, the Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department, to um, develop a roadmap 
for, uh, for grid modernization in the state of New Mexico. And we have convened a number of um, the best and the brightest from all corners of New Mexico to help us uh, put together that roadmap and to develop a series of technical and policy white papers uh, with recommendations on what we need to do next. And those will be public documents. I hope that you will all review them and give us comments on them when that, when that um, is available later this fall. Um, but we are very aggressively moving forward on uh, grid modernization, and that includes microgrids um, as well. I also want to point out that the state has a renewable energy transmission authority, and they are currently studying microgrids as well. They've been directed by the legislature to do so. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to note, this is something that you know, has all of our attention on a daily basis, including the governor. Yesterday, she appeared at a renewable energy finance forum um, with Wall Street and um, private sector executives from around the country really touting New Mexico and talking about our clean energy resources, the policy uh, landscape that we've been able to, to develop over the last few years and all the opportunities and inviting them to come here and hopefully hire all of you uh, to work for their, for their companies. So um, this is really important. This uh, summit is really timely um, and I wanna thank you for inviting me to participate. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We're so grateful that you're here with us today and it's always a pleasure to see you. Um, a smile that just lights up the room even when it's a virtual room. So I'm so grateful and I'm so grateful for the good work that you've been doing and the leadership and the vision that you've carried um, with our state. It's always, always good to see you. It's always visionary. The next person that we have with us today is Secretary um, Bill McCamley, who is the Secretary of the New Mexico Workforce Solutions. and um, Secretary McCamley, even when he was serving in our legislature, has long been a leader and an advocate for how we can actually address workforce um, in the state. So we're absolutely grateful to hear from the Secretary today. Secretary McCamley, it's always a pleasure to see you. Um, I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. Good morning and good morning to everybody. Um, as was said, my name is Bill McCamley. I'm the Secretary of the New Mexico Workforce Solutions Department. We do a couple of things, you know, we actually run the unemployment program for the state. And as everyone might imagine, we've been fairly busy the last six months. And as of yesterday, we had 124,163 New Mexicans uh, that were certifying, so receiving benefits for unemployment. While that number has come down a little bit from its highs back in May and June, that is still over double what the maximum number of people on unemployment were during the Great Recession, which is about 60,000 in March of 2009. So we are at an unprecedented level uh, with New Mexicans that are out of work. And so it is extremely critical now more than ever that we find new ways of getting folks back into not only jobs, but careers where people can stay in for a while, make a decent salary and provide for themselves, their families and their communities. That's even more important when we talk about clean energy, which is what we're talking about here today. And we've seen the effects of climate change. You know, we have almost had a one-two punch in terms of hurricanes that hit the Louisiana coast. That, that's unprecedented. We've had more named storms in the Atlantic and Caribbean than we've had, I think, ever. And we see the devastating, absolutely devastating effects of fires in the Western United States and in our own backyard. You know. Um, I work in Albuquerque, but I live in Santa Fe, and I saw those fires up in the mountains, and there were a couple of days where you could barely breathe, and so we are seeing it. It is real, it is here, and we need to do what we can to decrease our carbon footprint and making sure we have more clean energy available is huge. So this is big deal because of the jobs, and it's a huge deal because of the way we need to shift our energy. Um, I'd like to talk about three specific things in my introduction here. The first is, I'm so glad y'all are having a round table with employers. When we talk about workforce, we absolutely critically have to work with our employers to find out what their needs are so that when we're designing programs, they can be done with the skills needed to get those jobs. Sometimes there's a disconnect and sometimes educators get real excited about something and then they design a program and then students get out and aren't able to get those jobs. So thank you for having them here. Please continue to engage them. Secondly, we are encouraging very strongly the use of the apprenticeship model 
for these types of programs going forward. Uh, we actually just started a registered apprenticeship program with Affordable Solar. It is the first uh, solar apprenticeship program in the state. We're excited about it. We want to see how we can expand that. But it's really critical for the people that are participating in these programs because a lot of times they can't go into debt. They can't go um, and spend X amount of money without making some money to begin with. So finding ways of getting the education paid for as well as making some money while you're in the program so you can live and eat and get childcare and all those important things is absolutely critical. The last thing I would really encourage y'all to look at is gender in the distributed energy workforce. So I don't know how many of y'all know this, but I actually used to sell solar panels. I worked for Sunspot Solar Energy in Las Cruces, New Mexico for a year. And while our sales and leadership team were pretty diversified in terms of gender, every single person who were in our, in our installer teams was, was a dude. And we find that actually with a lot of our trades, we have 90, I think 97% of the apprentices in the registered trades here in New Mexico are gentlemen. And there's nothing stopping women from getting into these jobs uh, and making good money. So how we make sure that we address in our employment and our training programs, this real lack of gender diversity is gonna be a big deal. Uh, lastly, everybody, please, please wear your masks. We're never gonna get our economy back on track until we get this virus under control. So please, not only for yourselves, let everybody know, keep up social distancing, keep wearing the mask, keep not going to parties, and we'll get through this sucker together. Thank you all very much for the time. I really appreciate it. I hope you all have a great conference. Thank you so much, Secretary McCamley. <clears throat> um, I want to just sort of uh, dovetail on a little bit of what the Secretary has shared with us with regard to working with industry and working with the research that's coming out. Um, it's incredibly important, and that's why we're so grateful for those of you from the industry who are able to join us, as well as those researchers who are doing the cutting edge um, work in smart grid technologies. How do we actually close this gap. The research is coming out. We have the EPSCOR um, teams from NMSU, UNM, New Mexico Tech, doing some deep dive research, developing new processes, new procedures that need to be implemented into our infrastructure. And that's where we at Santa Fe Community College serve in the role of closing that gap between the the research and what needs to be implemented and how we actually deploy those new and improved technologies from the research sector into the workforce. So we're super grateful for that opportunity and to speak a little bit uh, to that and um, bring it home with Santa Fe Community College. I'd like to introduce Dr. Becky Rowley, the president of Santa Fe Community College. Dr. Rowley, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you very much, Camilla. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with everyone this morning. And I really appreciate what you all are doing uh, with this conference. I think it's vitally important. And this is one of the truly stellar projects uh, on the Santa Fe Community College campus. Um, I haven't been at the college all that long, but it, it's really, really impressive to watch the progress that we've made in this area and the excitement of our students too in, in being part of something so important. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank the EPSCOR team for their partnership and for the opportunity to align with the emerging technologies coming from the smart grid research institutions. This alignment assures that with our campus microgrid structure, we are able to meet growing workforce needs, which as Secretary McCamley said is so vitally important. I'd like to thank the Economic Development Administration, Region 6, for the financial support to develop the Microgrid Training Center. And I'd also like to acknowledge Mr. David Breaker from Microgrid Systems Laboratory for working with Santa Fe Community College, <clears throat> excuse me, to assure continued development and alignment of our distributed energy infrastructure with existing cutting edge technologies. We have a history of research and innovation at Santa Fe Community College, and we want to work with all undergraduate institutions to help develop the workforce statewide. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, and I hope that you get a great deal out of the next couple of days and we learn a lot and go forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Rowley, sincerely. Thank you for being here.
and um, thank you all. The next person that I want to um, introduce is Frank Curry. Um, Frank Curry is um, brought to us from uh, the EPSCOR grant. We were able to hire Frank because of our participation um, in this program. Frank came from Sandia National Laboratory. You all um, have his bio available to you. Frank is going to introduce us to our keynote speaker this morning. Frank is the lead faculty for the Smart Microgrid Training Center at Santa Fe Community College. Um, let's welcome Frank Curry. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I'm really just going to not talk about me and what I'm doing right now, where that's going to come later. Um, right now, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. You heard a little bit earlier about uh, um, legislation that has passed uh, in the past year uh, in New Mexico and from uh, Secretary Probst. And one of the driving forces behind <clears throat> sustainability uh, legislation, uh, grid modernization in New Mexico is Abbas Akil. Um, Abbas brought, uh, two years ago, Abbas was elected to uh, the New Mexico State uh, House. Um, he's the representative for District 20, and he comes with more than 20 years of um, time at Sandia National Laboratories in their energy storage program. He now is the principal of Renewable Energy Ventures, um, and he has a vast uh, wealth of information um, and experience and insight when it comes to, uh, to, to energy and sustainability and how we can move this forward. So um, I guess with that, I would like to say thank you, Abbas Akil, for coming and speaking with us today. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I really want to congratulate also the Santa Fe Community College for taking the lead in this exciting field and giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Um, this is a major area in our renewable energy future, and their leadership is outstanding and, and truly cutting edge. It was early on that they took a lead in this and they have continued to work. Uh, and of course, developing the workforce that we need, as Secretary McCamley said, is really in, important. It's an integral part of that. Without that, all our hardware that we will install in the future, of course, you know, needs to be serviced, installed, and maintained. Um, I also want to recognize that we have tremendous talent in our state. We have three national labs, we have excellent academic institutions, and we have an amazing innovation spirit. You know, and the, uh, that, that will definitely propel us forward. And the fact that we have such a diverse, rich cultural heritage, we need to recognize and honor that because each one brings a different perspective to this field. Um, so again, it's an honor for me to serve the state and uh, let me share some thoughts about distributed generation and in the electric grid and all. So next slide, please. There you go. So this slide uh, shows that, you know, despite the fact that some people think that we have one large electric grid that's connected from coast to coast, that is not really the case. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we have divided the country into several regions. And as you can see from this map, New Mexico sits at the extreme southeast corner of this, the western region. Uh, the reason for doing this was just so that we could share uh, energy between our partners and our neighbors. Whenever there's a shortage, we lean on them. And when they have a shortage, they lean on us. So it's a good way to manage our, our resources and make them more efficient. And, and this has served us well for many, many years. Um, now, what happens here is between the regions, uh, there's a discrepancy. And I'll go into that in the next slide. Uh, let's go to the next slide. There you go. Uh, this is basically the depiction of the Western region that I showed you just now but it also shows the major transmission corridors that exist that interconnect us to our neighbors. And this entire network extends from uh, British Columbia down into Mexico. Uh, but the fact is that we are an island, a large island unto ourselves. And the reason this happens is that's how when we created this grid, our neighbors created their grid. And in very simple terms, 
our electrons do not march in step with their electrons. So, which is why it is very hard to interconnect these disparate regions. We have to literally change at the point of interconnection, if we have one, change the way the electric electrons march and make sure that they are in step with the electrons of the neighboring region. And that happens only in what, I think there's seven places in the country where it happens. So if you look at New Mexico on the Eastern border, there are two red boxes with an X mark in them. That is two locations where we do have the capability to change our electrons, put them in phase with the neighboring region, and then we can transfer electricity back and forth. So this is important to recognize because we really don't have a large interconnected coast to coast national grid. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this drilling down, uh, this is the map of our own state. And the, it, the reason I'm showing this is to show you that the existing network of transmission corridors and paths that we have is very limited. And it's mostly west of the Rio Grande. So if you look at the red lines, uh, starting from the northwest corner, which is where we built San Juan Generating Station, which was our largest coal producing uh, generating station. Uh, there are two red lines that come down to Albuquerque. And those were the two major uh, transmission, original major transmission pathways that we had. Later on, we built some other lines, but still you can see that pretty much all our transmission backbone is to the west. There's really one major line going to the east uh, and a few other smaller transmission lines. Now the red lines are the high voltage lines. They're 345 kilovolts. There are smaller lines of 115 and 230 kV, which you might not be able to see on this map, but they, they do interconnect us from the larger urban areas like Albuquerque and Santa Fe, Las Cruces into the smaller rural communities. Um, the shaded areas that you see, and I borrowed this map from PNM, that those are areas which are served by public service of New Mexico. Uh, and then what we need to see from this slide is that all our re renewable energy resources, especially our large wind resource, is all in the eastern part of the state. Uh, and then solar can is pretty much all over the state, but most of it is uh, more available in the south, southern part of the state in the lower belt, which goes across from Las Cruces, Deming and all. So given the fact that we have these resources in the east, we really don't have the transmission corridors to bring that power to the load centers and export it to other neighboring states as we do. At, at present, it doesn't exist uh, in a great capacity. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, that kind of lays down the bigger picture. Now let's drill down to what happened in the legislative actions that we took last year um, and, and this year. Of course, you know, Secretary Probst has mentioned the Energy Transition Act. Uh, that was uh, Senate Bill 489 passed in 2019. And then the Energy Grid Modernization Roadmap, which was HB 233 in 2020. Uh, and then the, the two or three others, the more important one also is community solar. Uh, this was a bill that was really intended to bring uh, so solar resources and energy to people who would not normally be uh, you know, able to utilize it because they may be living in apartments or condominiums and it is there, you know, they do not have a rooftop where they can install the solar. So this, was, this is a bill that has been adopted in other states as well. We want to use it here as two, but unfortunately, last year it died. So the notation there, API, means action postponed indefinitely, which means basically it didn't make it out of the House or the Senate. Uh, the next bill was study of smart hybrid microgrids for new energy. This was a memorial in um, HM71 in 2019, and I'll cover that also later on. Uh, and then the last one, uh, 
and, and these are just a, you know, a small selection of the bills that were passed. Now, I just want to highlight those that are relevant to our discussion today. The Renewable Energy Transmission Authority, RETA, uh, it was House Bill 426, which also died, but uh, we and Representative Day Hawkman Vihill were able to give money directly to RETA to conduct a study. And the reason for doing this, identify what transmission uh, pathways we have now, what is the capacity, and what additional pathways we need in the future to, in order to serve all the renewable energy that we will develop as we move into this future. Uh, that study has just been completed, and it, it identified that we have a potential of up to 11 and a half gigawatts of renewable capacity. We will need about 1,300 miles of new transmission lines. All of this will require about nine to 11 billion dollars of developer investment through 2030. But what's important for today's discussion is. All this activity will also generate 3,700 temporary and permanent jobs, uh, out of which after the construction is over, there will still be six to 800 permanent jobs to serve this, uh, this industry, basically. So uh, that, that is something that we need to keep in mind because as our uh, oil and uh, gas uh, revenues decline and, and our production declines, this is how we want to create new jobs, new opportunities for our workforce in the renewable energy field. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So in these slides, I want to take those five or six legislative actions and cover each one uh, in detail. So the Energy Transition Act is what I call the Mother Act. Basically, this is the umbrella under which we need to have more pieces. The act itself laid out three major goals. Uh, the first one was we'll be at 50% clean energy by 2030. The second one was 80% by 2040. And finally, in 2045, we should be at 100% carbon free. This was the goal that was laid out by the Energy Transition Act. And the, you know, being a goal, we still need the pieces to fill in. But in any case, the other important piece that was really uh, a key piece of this legislation was to allow PNM to refinance the loan to pay off uh, San Juan Generating Station because we are asking them to shut it down prematurely and quickly. So this allows them to recover the investment and pay it off. And, uh, and going into the financial details, actually, that was a really good arrangement which favors our um, us as citizens, and it does save us some uh, quite a bit of money. Um, in addition to that, since the economy in Farmington and San Juan is going to shift from coal to renewable energy, we've provided funds to San Juan for developing the workforce and retraining and their own economic development. But as I said, this is these are just goals, and what is needed is more legislation to backfill and provide a pathway of how we achieve those goals. So next slide, please. Um, the next one was the Energy Grid Modernization Roadmap, which Secretary Props uh, referred to. Now, as we know, uh, our state is served by three uh, major investor-owned utilities, and then there work is supplemented by 16, almost 20 cooperatives that operate in the rural areas of our state. Now, one important difference that we need to recognize is uh, the investor-owned utilities serve a more dense population center. They, uh, by statistics-wise, they serve 35 customers for every mile of distribution wire that they have, whereas the co-ops would serve a very sparse population in rural areas, their statistics are that they serve only seven customers per mile. So there's a big disconnect between the density of customers that each entity serves. Um, so what is grid modernization and why is it necessary and who 
will benefit from it? I mean, these are the you know questions we need to ask. Now, grid modernization is nothing but making sure that the grid becomes more interactive. It provides more information to you as a consumer of energy in a very timely and if possible, even in real time manner. And it allows the, op the utilities as operators of the network to see exactly what is happening all the way to your home. Uh, something we need to recognize now is the ability of, let's say, public service of New Mexico to see what is happening in that part of the grid, which is what we call the grid edge, is very limited. Right now, the control only extends to a substation. Beyond that, like, you know, for example, the outages that happened yesterday. Of course, when a large outage happens, they can see it. But individually, in a neighborhood level, they do not know whether you have lost power or not until you and your neighbors start calling PNM to say we've lost power. So in a modern grid, that we open up that visibility and they can see all the way to the edge of the grid exactly what is happening, who's generating power, who's consuming the power. Um, it is not one technology that does this. Grid modernization is a whole suite of technologies. Uh, they don't need to be implemented at the same time. They can be done sequentially. And they can include things like smart meters, energy storage, uh, electric vehicle chargers, um, you know, demand response strategies and things like that. So as Secretary Prop said, uh, HB 233, this bill, it tasks the Energy Minerals and Natural Resources Department to complete, uh, to assemble and complete a roadmap of how we do this grid modernization. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next one is the Community Solar Act. Now, this, as I said earlier, is uh, it really dispels the notion that solar is for the rich people, that you can install solar only if you have a home and a rooftop on which you can put the panels. This breaks down that myth and makes uh, solar accessible to pretty much everybody, whether they own a home or not, it can be people who live in apartments, condominiums. It also allows more solar to be used in tribal lands. That's one thing that we would like to see. Uh, and then the way it works is a developer builds a system, uh, let's say nominally it's five megawatts, and that developer then sells subscriptions, just like a subscription to a magazine. Uh, he, they sell subscriptions to a group of people who say, yes, we want to participate in, and we want to take part and buy solar uh, from this developer. So that, no, one second, I lost my slides. There you go. Um, so that is the intent of this bill, you know, and several other states have adopted it. Uh, it could literally add significantly more solar and storage capacity to our grid. And more than that, it really has a pretty high potential for jobs because we need a trained workforce to install and maintain these systems as they proliferate in, within the grid. Uh, this bill, unfortunately, did not pass in the last legislative session, but right now there's a new effort. Uh, it's uh, being led by Senator Stefanix and Representative Roy Ball Caballero. And I'm pretty sure they'll present a very credible bill in the 2021 session. And uh, you know, I'm very hopeful that it will pass. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'm showing here uh, for digressing for a minute is just to give you an idea of the major components of the electric grid. So if you look to the left, uh, that is a portion where, where the electricity is actually generated, and that's like the San Juan coal plant. And then in the middle section, you have the transmission corridors. It's all the transmission poles, all the transmission wires, substations that take the energy from the generating station and bring it closer to you. But before that reaches you, there's one more step where the voltage is stepped down because these, the transmission lines are all at a high voltage, anywhere from you know, 700 kilovolts down to 
you know, 150 kilovolts. There's a step down transformer closer to your home, which reduces that voltage to a much more safer level, uh, normally about 120 to 240, 440 volts. And that is then distributed to the customers that I illustrate on the right hand side of the slide. These are large customers, uh, industrial customers, commercial customers, and finally, your home uh, at the lowest uh, voltage level. So this is important because we're, what we are talking about today is distributed energy systems. And the distributed energy systems fit on the right-hand side of the system where the voltage is lower and it's closer to the point of use, which is your home or your business. Okay, let me see if I've covered everything here. Um, so that kind of frames where distributed energy fits. It's not in the left-hand side, it's all on the right-hand side. So next slide, please. So when we talk about distributed energy resources, what, you know, what do we mean by that? And again, as I said, these, this is a suite of technologies. It can be made up of microgrids, uh, all the rooftop solar that you use is part of a distributed energy uh, system. Uh, community solar is a distributed energy system as well. And, and any storage, energy storage that you install in a home, at a substation, or in a small commercial building, that is also a distributed energy system. Uh, and then at some point, it is quite possible that we will have electric vehicles who also have storage on board, which is the battery that drives the car, it's very possible that they will be able to back feed to the grid. And that's what we call vehicle to grid. That is a work, it's a technology that's still evolving. Uh, there's a lot of uh, considerations that go into that safety, you know, warranty of the battery, things like that. So, but at some point in the future, we want to be able to utilize that because as we have a growing population of electric vehicles, it is you know, obviously to our advantage to use that storage to support the grid and vice versa. Uh, next slide, please. So let me focus on the workforce needs. Uh, this is, yeah, I think I'm the right one, yeah. Um, the workforce that we need goes back to the technologies that I just talked about. Uh, you've got distributed residential solar plus storage. Uh, you've got also workforce for the large central station uh, solar power plants. You've got the large wind turbines that needs a workforce. There's a trained workforce that is necessary for the transmission line construction and maintenance. Uh, that's not nothing new. Most all the utility companies have that kind of a trained workforce at this time, but we need to expand it because we, our network is going to grow. Uh, something new is battery energy storage. This is, again, a training that will be needed for the workforce and a place like Santa Fe Community College is an excellent, and that is the mission that they have for themselves is to train this kind of workforce that is needed. Then of course, electric vehicles and charging stations uh, microgrids, both the installation and maintenance uh, and the operations. You've got the electrical distribution system. And let's not forget the fact that all this hardware, the backbone in the background is software. What software drives this hardware? Uh, how do we perform the analysis to see how it is working, what it is doing? And of course, the cybersecurity to keep it safe not only to protect your information, but also to make sure that it is operated as it should and nobody else takes control of it and makes it do things that we don't want it to do. So cybersecurity is an equally important part of this workforce training. So we need people not only the hardware, but also for the software. Um, and of course, you know, renewable and distributed systems manufacturing. Unfortunately, within our state, we don't do much of the manufacturing. Uh, we, we do some. Uh, actually, we have a couple of industries that are working worldwide in providing the racks that support the solar panels that you use. Uh, 
those they are doing very well but there's a whole host of other technologies that that are in required for renewable energy that we do not have any manufacturing in the state at this time um, and it could be something simple you know like making the the steel towers for the wind turbines uh, or making the blades that go on these wind turbines so we need to look at that too we need to make sure that we have a manufacturing infrastructure to support our renewable future at this time most of this technology and hardware is imported from other states we can change that and we need to change that so manufacturing is an important component of our future so with that i think i've used up pretty much all my time for my presentation and to the next slide you know any questions i don't know if you want to have questions now or wait till later but certainly i am open to questions on anything that we have discussed so far and again thank you very much for your time and please stay safe in this pandemic we will get through this and look forward to a bright future uh, for our state thank you so abbas this is frank um yeah we've got about 10 minutes for questions if you have questions if you could please put them into the Zoom Q&A feature that you're, you'll see down at the bottom of your screen, and then I will take those questions and field them for Abbas. Um, and Abbas, we've got one already from Ann Jekyll, uh, and it says, what's the primary source of opposition to community solar? So what are the, and what are the reasons for this opposition? Um, so I wouldn't say, uh, yes, opposition in the sense there was pushback when we discussed the bill and presented it last year. Mostly it was operational considerations. And by that, I mean, for example, the proponents of the bill wanted the size of the community solar systems to be up to 10 megawatts. Operationally, that's a difficult thing to do because when you tie in 10 megawatts into a substation, that's pretty much a third of its capacity. And most substations do not have the wherewithal to accept that much uh, solar or the generation into uh, its network. So the requirement that was asked for by the stakeholders who were concerned with this was to reduce that to maybe five megawatts. And if you look at the other states that have done community solar, most of them have capped it at five. So there was really no justifiable technical reason for us to push up the limit to 10 megawatts. That was one of the pushbacks. The other things were you know, just normal things like, all right, if you have 10 megawatts, in New Mexico, you need about five or six acres per megawatt, which means you really need about 50 or 60 acres of land available close to a substation uh, to be able to build a community solar if it is up to 10 megawatts. So there are technical issues like that, there was pushback. And the way we are doing it now is to resolve those issues before we get to the committees and make sure that everybody's on the same page. And I hope that answers your question. I think, uh, I think one thing that I would point out, just to put it more at a, at a, at a layperson level, is that slide that you put up of the electric system, um, of our electricity system, the generating station, the transmission lines going into the customers. There are just some like green lines and they show customers. But um, one of the things that people may not really understand is that that transmission system and that, uh, that energy system has been built over more than 100 years. And it was built from that central perspective. So those generation stations taking the energy into the end use customers is the way things are put together. So when we talk about um, distributed energy and getting down to that green part of, of a boss's slide, that requires, um, there, there's equipment that needs to go in there. We need a lot more information about our systems. That's where the workforce training comes in, a lot of workforce training to, um, to create um, new workers who understand new, uh, new problems because we've got to basically, when we talk about grid modernization, we've got to add a lot of equipment. We've got to start with what we have and then we've got to figure out how to push back and make it what we want it to be. And so, um, and so the system just isn't really designed so far for all the energy resources to be on that distribution side. So um, there has been for decades and will continue to be, but I think less and less pushback um, as we get more and more people who go into the PNMs of the world, understanding how these things work and, and, and how to make it all function smoothly. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. 
We do. Um, there's one in the chat. Oh. Okay. Is this, is there a resource? All right. Um, so there's a question. Um, is there a resource that I mean, is it, Yeah. You see it, Abbas? Yeah. So, there's the resource identifies. that identifies all the education workforce uh, education training options for each workforce area that I've identified on a slide. Um, I guess, are you referring to the educational institutions like the Santa Fe Community College or the Mesa Lands Community College? Is that uh, the intent of your question? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So yes, we are actually very fortunate. Uh, very early on, Santa Fe Community College took on this uh, mission of saying, all right, what are the workforce for, uh, needs of the future? Uh, they not only uh, visualize that, but they build the hardware to train that workforce and educate them. And the same thing happened on the east side of our state and the Mesa Lands Community College. They were fortunate enough to install large wind turbines. And there's some wonderful pictures if you go to the website, because these wind turbine towers are high. They are heavy equipment, very specialized training. So they are able to offer hands-on training to their uh, students how to work and maintain these large machines. Uh, and, and that's really very cutting edge too. So we are very fortunate. And on the west side, there's also a community college in Farmington, which is doing the same thing. They are more focused on oil and gas right now, but they are changing their mission to include renewable energy. So we are fortunate to have the statewide network and of course, the universities are doing their part in higher education. So there's cutting edge research. There's you know, research going on at New Mexico State University, which is an excellent power engineering program. So all this together really positions us in a good, safe place where we can handle all the needs of our future. Boss, I see uh, two more questions. There's one in the Q&A and there's one in the chat. And the first one that came up was from uh, Gary Appendell, and it says, how can we get regulators to allow for integrative, excuse me, integrative, innovative pilot programs to move us forward rapidly? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Given the fact that we have a pandemic, there's going to be a great shortage of money uh, going forward because we need to focus on our economic recovery as well. But uh, the conversations that have been going on with the speaker, the speaker of the house, um, Representative Brian Egoff, uh, is very good. So what he's doing is he's actually reserving some slots to make sure that the, the focus is not entirely on economic recovery, but we have openings and slots for bills such as bills related to energy. So I think that is, that's important. And the legislators do recognize that some incentives are needed to push this forward. So that is definitely there. I'm pretty confident that there are good legislators like Representative Nathan Small, Representative Melanie Stansbury, and in the Senate, it's Senator Mimi Stewart, Senator Tallman, so many other, you know, Jerry Ortizzi Pino. There are legislators who recognize the need to also move forward in the energy space. So I'm very confident that this work will go on. And then we've got a question from uh, David Breaker, um, who would like to know, like you yes, to how microgrids can Good morning. Add. Uh, the outage of yesterday and the you know, last couple of days and everything that's happening in California is an excellent example. Uh, what we did, as Frank explained, and I should have pointed it out in my slide, the traditional wisdom was to build large power plants far away from the uh, urban centers. So you don't see the smoke, you don't smell the you know, odor or anything. It's not in your backyard, somewhere 200 miles away. That was fine, but it required large transmission lines spanning 500 miles, 700 miles coming to the urban center. Well, what happens if there's a fire and you lose that transmission line, you lose your load. And the communities that are going through the fires in California now are feeling the brunt of that because they are isolated from these power generation centers. So what a microgrid does is it moves the generating capacity right close to your urban and load center locations. That is what a microgrid does. It basically collapses the entire large grid into a micro scale 
and moves it close to you so that when there's an emergency and you do need to recover from a natural disaster or man-made disaster, then it is possible for you to do that or go to that recovery quickly because now you don't have to rely on repairing 200 miles of transmission line. Your energy sources are right next to you. They are under your control and more accessible to you than there's a power plant you know, 300 miles away. So that is what a microgrid does. It replicates a larger grid in a very small geographic area close to you so that you can have a quicker recovery, which is what your resiliency is, how quickly you can recover from a disaster. It makes it much more quicker and more uh, feasible for you to do that. That's what microgrids do. Yeah, the boss, before I came to Santa Fe Community College, when I was working for Sandia National Labs, we were working specifically um, in Puerto Rico. And one of the projects that I was working on had to do with using existing hydro in the mountain region, um, putting in some solar and some energy storage and getting communities that in some cases went as long as a year without power because of uh, transmission lines that had been blown apart. Um, we were looking at ways that we could get communities up and running in, you know, it's still a long time for the mainland maybe, but you know, maybe weeks instead of, instead of a year in some cases. So that's, it's, it's a kind of an extreme example, but that's exactly what they do. If we put the, the energy resources near where they're needed, then we've got the opportunity to keep things running. I see uh, two more questions and then we're kind of running out of time. Um, first, Steve Gomez would like to know uh, that when you're finished with the legislature, we'll be looking for an adjunct faculty position. So yes, I could absolutely um, use, use somebody teaching in the distributed energy program. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Steve, Frank, I'd be honored to do that. And I really, I enjoy interacting with our young generation because this is our future. And we need to bring, you know, or not only the current knowledge to them, but, but some historical perspective. It, it's always good to see why we got to where we are and to learn from that. And how can we change our future pathways to perhaps improve the situation that we have right now? So yes, it would be my honor to, to teach if I can or do a few seminars. I'd love to do that. All right. And then I think we've got our final question up here um, from John Usury. Do these plans address the possibilities for combined heat and power um, systems that generate energy, especially at night and in the winter when solar is least available? Uh, you know, Europe was actually much more advanced in heat and uh, combined heat and power. Unfortunately, because of the fact that we moved our generation plants away from urban centers, like in San Juan generating station, you know, the, the efficiency is only about 30% at best which means two thirds of the energy that is present in the fuel source goes up the stack. Uh, that can change. In fact, microgrids is a really good opportunity to do that because now your generation, which also is a source of heat because all that heat is used to generate the energy but most of it is exhausted to the atmosphere. You can capture that and use it in industrial process or even home heating, uh, you know, regional heating the campuses are a good example. Uh, University of New Mexico utilizes pretty much all the heat that is coming out of the generators to heat the campus. The same thing can be done uh, in other, uh, you know, smaller communities. But Europe is much more advanced in using that. The technology is there; it's proven. Uh, there's not no, you know, there's, it's not rocket science. It is just the co-location of the users that we need, which at this point is not there. All right. Thank you, Abbas. I think that wraps up our time for now. I appreciate all the questions and very much we all appreciate your coming to speak with us today. It's been very insightful. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, everybody, for giving me the time. And hopefully we'll see you in the future and we'll have a great uh, energy future for our state. Thank you. Hey, all this is Selena. I just want to let you know we're uh, wrapping up this session. And we will be starting at 10.15 in the, in, the, in the next session. And I'll paste that link in, in the chat if you need it, but you can also check in with your e-agenda and the link will be there. So uh, good session, everybody. And we'll see you all at 10.15. Uh, we'll start promptly at 10.15. So make sure you're, you're in, the, in the session by 10.10 or so.